welcome everybody back to, if I can say back this time, to Ears to Hear, our, our second uh, podcast, uh, you know, the, the two of us speaking about the, the spiritual things that are in our minds and in our minds and our hearts, and uh, we are, we're grateful that you guys came back to listen <laughs> and that you made it through <laughs> the, the difficulties. Hopefully uh, this time we'll be much better around. You might actually be able to hear me. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we. Uh, what, what do you want to introduce the topic for us, Alan? Yeah, so we are we are talking about general conference, kind of the prep and getting ready for general conference. Yeah. Yeah, I think we we looked at the calendar and realized what was coming up, and and it felt right to us to talk about this now. Especially, I know for me, uh, I always got more out of conference preparation than I necessarily do from from the recap. Not that there's not any value in the recap, but I've I've discovered in my life that if I can come to conference more prepared, uh, spiritually minded, that there can be things that happen during the conference for me spiritually that don't necessarily happen if I'm not. Um, there's, you know, you can always go back and review a talk, but there's something about the first time you hear it. And I think when you're in the right spot with the spirit, uh, you can get inspiration that can, that can be a guiding post for the next six months of our lives. And I think that's one of the, the one, one of the many beauties that come from general conference. I guess I should also state for those who don't really know if there are some non uh, LDS Christians uh, listening. You know, we we firmly and boldly believe that the priesthood of God has been restored, and that select men, just like God has in times past, He's ordained those men to officiate in His church as leaders. And every six months, they speak to the entire congregation. Well, they're talking to the world, really. I mean, they are talking to the membership of the church, but it really is a testament to the world about where they stand as apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ and their testimony and the things that they see coming for the world and what we need to do moving forward. You know, it's interesting, too, because when you say that, it reminded me of, you know, when you look at General Conference, a lot of times I think we get into the mindset where we think, hey, this is, you know, for the LDS people, this is our prophet. Mm -hmm. And just like you're saying, it's not just the, you know, he's not the prophet for the LDS people, right? Mm -hmm. He is the prophet. You know, he is the Lord's mouthpiece on the earth today for the world. And that's, you know, I think that that takes some getting used to even now. Because yeah. even now I think, and I say, oh yeah, that, that's our, our prophet, prophet. Yeah. right? <laughs> that's our, that's our LDS prophet. And I think, I think that, you know, I, I found that that stemmed, even on my mission, you know, it's almost you don't want to offend anybody, right? right? You don't want to make someone's faith feel lackluster or second rate, and and to some degree that's true. I mean, for all of us who are are searching to follow Christ and come closer to Christ, especially during these times that we're living in, uh, you're on the right path, <laughs> you know. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we don't want to devalue that. But at the same time, I think it's it's a good reminder that this isn't just for us. This is for everybody. And anybody that's willing to listen, if they have their heart in the right spot, I think they'll recognize the truth of these people that have devoted their lives to taking on the, the mantle of a prophet. I can't even imagine. I mean, you had you had like you, know, you had Moses, you had Elias, you had Elijah, you know, all these people who who took on the role of prophet for their people and they felt the weight of the spiritual nature of the people that they were serving. That there was there's some stewardship in all that, and the and the prophet he feels that for the entire world. I can't I can't even imagine, <laughs> you know, and what kind of person the Lord prepares and gets ready for that position, so that when they get to that point, they can handle. It. And you look at President Nelson, and he definitely you can tell that he has been prepared and he is ready, <laughs> you know, for this calling. You can see that his mind is it's like it's been prepared for this situation. He's been thinking about what he what we need to do for our times it's interesting too because in in preparation for the podcast i went through it's kind of cool because you have an idea in your head when you're first starting out when you're doing your study right yeah. you're thinking okay 
I'm pointing myself in this north direction here on the compass, and I'm heading towards this this topic, you know, in, yeah. the, in heading north. But then along the way, you find that, you know, if if you do it right anyway, you'll find that all of a sudden you start to kind of get guided, and you start to veer all of a sudden to the northeast. And then, you know, pretty soon you've wound up somewhere you have, you know, you didn't plan on being. Yeah. And that's kind of how it was for me, because I had the idea of planning it a certain way. And what you're talking about here just kind of reminded me of that, because what is the prophet, really? Where does, how does the prophet get called? For people that may, who may not be LDS. Oh, that's, yeah, that's a good point. Right, he is, he's essentially Peter, right? Yeah. He's, the, he's the chiefest apostle. Yeah. So that he's selected from the twelve, and he is the chiefest apostle. And that's who the you know, our, our prophet is, he's, he's our leader. And that's not to say that the other 12 are not prophet seers and revelators, right? We sustain them as prophet seers and revelators. Yeah. But the, the prophet is the chiefest apostle, just like Peter was the chiefest apostle after Christ left. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, it, you talk about like where you were directed, you know, as we were preparing for this, you know, and, and you know, I wasn't quite sure exactly where I was going to land, but uh, I focused on. There's one individual talk, and I'm. And before I even get there, though, you know, we we talked last time about how you know going to church. What's the point of going to church if you're not challenged on your beliefs? If you don't, right. you know, if you don't hear something occasionally that challenges what you think and feel, if you're not slightly offended, you know, what's the point of even going? And I feel like. The church at large, at least they used to, was less offended generally at general conference. We it's almost like we would go into this expecting to hear how we weren't, you know, living up to the expectations. And and it's interesting, at least personally, I feel like I've seen in the last four, five years, that instead of when we hear something over the pulpit at general conference, instead of thinking about, okay, what does that mean for me? How can I improve my lives? I feel like I see a lot of people criticizing the leaders of our church. They're, they're, they have a hard time accepting the truth of what they hear. And instead of trying to incorporate those changes and make a difference, they, they'd rather rail against it and decide if this person still has any value when it comes to what they're saying, which I think is, is interesting because as a member of the church, you've accepted that God has his selected servants. You know, surely the Lord will do nothing save he does it through the prophets, right? And yet, if we don't believe that they can tell us that we're off on something, then what's the point of having them there? Absolutely. And you mentioned that. That was a really good point. Because if you go back and listen to previous general conferences from like the 70s and the 60s, it's really cool, you know, to do it because it's the same doctrine being preached. Mm -hmm. But the delivery is different because I think that it was a more obedient people back then. Interesting. It, it, it's very interesting that you mention that, because as I was studying, I kind of ran into that a little bit, right? And I've gone back. It's it's just kind of fun to do anyway, right? If you're mm -hmm. having a personal study or if you're working out or something like that, to listen to some of those older general conferences, because they, you know, they'll, they'll sit there and just pound on food storage on family home evening, you know what I mean? Yeah. Some of those things that were new back then, these, these were new principles that they were teaching, right? That you're supposed to get together and with your family once a week and talk about Christ, you know what I mean? And teach your kids, have them at your feet and teach them. Mm -hmm. But I definitely agree with you that back then the people were a lot more obedient and, and teachable. Mm -hmm. Whereas today, you make some of the changes that President Nelson has changed or you have President Uchtdorf go back to just, you know, doing something in the 12 and yeah. not being the first presidency, and people get their feathers ruffled mm -hmm. over that, right? Yeah. And we're not saying, hey, sacrifice some of your budget and go get some food storage. You know what I mean? If you go back to some of those food storage um, talks and presentations that they did in General Conference, it was like, hey, sacrifice some of your budget. What, what can you cut, you know, out of your budget? to go get some food storage, to yeah. go plant a garden. And it's not like that anymore. No. You know what I mean? <laughs> they have a softer delivery now than they did back then, I believe, mm -hmm. right? But our people are 
a lot more uh, prone to getting their ire up over changes. Mm -hmm. And this is when the the mouthpiece of God is is telling us, right? (laughs) (laughs) It's interesting. That was a very good point. Yeah. And and I guess to be fair, we don't want to be condescending to anybody who who struggles. Because that means that's very real, especially for you. I've had my ire up. Yes. You know, (laughs) I've had my ire up before. Yep. Yeah, and I'll relate this, you know. We didn't steer away from the, the, the hard topics, right? I remember no. I was I was almost completely against the whole mask idea uh, from the beginning, right? I, I had a lot of reservations, you know, and and if I'm being honest, I have my tinfoil hats. I'm a little bit of a conspiracy theorist. I think you can go ahead and say we we okay. <laughs> you can go ahead and say we on that. I think uh, I think there's truth, you know. There's it's a little tricky, but I think there's truth in a lot of the conspiracy theories, right? And so I was, I was, I stayed on the fence for a long time, and then I started to move towards the no, I'm not sure these masks are really doing what they're telling us. And then we get our area presidency to come out and really just more or less encourage us strongly uh, with the weight of their calling to wear masks in public places. And man, that was tough for me, you know. And and uh, I've had. You know, I've gone to conference and, and felt, okay, this is, you know, they're talking to me here. Uh, there's there's something in my life that's not quite in harmony. I can fix this. This was like, I was going the other direction. <laughs> you know, I was, I was not ready for that. And it, I had to do a little bit of coming to Jesus with that, you know. And, and if I'm honest, there's still times I struggle with it because there's a lot going on right now. And it's so politicized and and almost Heavily to be like, yes. Heavily. and And to... To kind of like reverse course and be like, oh, maybe I was wrong on this. Really sucks right now. It really it's difficult to deal with. But just because just because I had that reaction to it doesn't necessarily make the counter reaction right. And I, you know, I feel like poor President Oaks. He, I feel like every talk he gives, I just see a wall of people who just disagree with him and wondering if, you know, people wondering if he's even an apostle anymore because of the things that he's saying. Yeah. And and it, it kind of saddens me a little bit because I love that man. <laughs> you know, I, I've, I've grown up listening to him and I recognize the spirit confirm truth when they speak, when he speaks. Well, and he was one when we were going on missions. You know, he was one that we were looking to. Anybody from that era... I have a special place in my heart for it yeah. because they were there for me during hard times and they taught me good thing, doctrine and stuff during hard times. Mm-hmm. So that's, I mean, I, I guess a little bit of counsel going into the general conference. If you hear something and it offends you, I think that's a very wonderful opportunity to have a one-on-one with the Lord and, and figure out why. And, you know, and, and our leaders, they are imperfect. You know, they and they, they never claim to be perfect, you know. They're striving to do the best they can with their stewardship. But I believe, and this might be a little controversial to some people, but I fully believe that we are blessed for obedience to those those servants for their stewardship, even when they make mistakes, even if they may not be fully correct. I have a a decent example of this, you know, way back way back when it was it's been a little while but they came up with that policy that that children who were children of people who were homosexual parents couldn't be baptized right right and that was that caused a big stir especially in some of my family circles and uh you know uh it was interesting i i i totally defended i was like okay we, we just have to follow the prophet at this point but a lot of people had issues with that and the interesting thing is they ended up changing that that's something that they ended up reversing later now, did I, I didn't get angry at the fact that I was defending the, the policy and then they changed it. I just, I, I went in tow with like, okay, well, now that's something we don't need to worry about. And I wonder if the people who were on the other end were like, this is wrong. I wonder if they felt justified or if they felt, you know, like finally, you know, they were listening to me or if they just went in tow with like, okay, Heavenly Father, you know, he helped correct his servants. But I still feel like even though that's something that changed, I was blessed for the obedience of listening to the prophet because you know there's certain things about the doctrine of the church that just aren't going to change that they're hardcore uh set into the foundations of how this world works and how the priesthood works and how the church operates you know you say that too and it in my mind as you're talking about that i'm having 
danger sirens going off, right? <laughs> yeah. Because any time that you start to feel like you know better than the mouthpiece of God, right? Yeah. You need to go back. <laughs> you need to go back to the foundation and start going over some of these things, right? And you mm-hmm. need to do a gut check, right? Yeah. We talked about that last time, doing a gut check when somebody's at the pulpit. That is a time when the prophet is talking and you're getting your ire up and something is offending you to do a gut check and be like, hey, is this the gospel of Jesus Christ? Is this the, the, the Lord's mouthpiece, right? Is the Book of Mormon true? Go through and make those things. And if, if any one of those is lacking, go back and, and hit that again, right? Because that is a slippery slope. Mm-hmm. When you start to feel like you know better than the prophet or one of the 12, and they're up there at the pulpit giving us instruction. When they're up at the pulpit, they're delivering us the message that the Lord would have them deliver. Yeah. Right, they. That is scripture for our day. I was um, in doing my research. I actually came across um, that quote, and it's from. Let me see if I can find it really quick. Yes. Okay. So this was Ezra Taft Benson. Love that man. Very good man. <laughs> Solid dude. The most important prophet, so far as we are concerned, is the one who is living in our day and age. And then he goes on to talk about how every generation needs the ancient scripture as well as the modern scripture. And where do we get the modern scripture? From our prophet, From our prophet who is at the pulpit, mm-hmm. right? Or in an ensign message from, you know, from one of the church magazines where they come out, they're addressing the people. They are acting as the Lord's mouthpiece in, in, that, in that moment. Mm-hmm. And... If we start to have problems like that, you know, it, it, it's funny because they'll come out and make judgment calls on things. And we'll have, you know, our ire up and stuff. But, but also, they told us not to drink coffee. They told us not to drink tea. Mm-hmm. They told us not to use tobacco, right? Yeah. At one time. Green or black tea for the record. Right, Herbal yeah. Herbal teas are okay for you people. Yeah, there. exactly. <laughs> but, you know. I think that there's a misconception, too, because, and I'm just going to use the word of wisdom to to illustrate this, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's kind of a a tendency to take the word of wisdom and justify it, right? We're we're taking Babylon, and we're taking the word of God, and we're trying to make them compatible, just like we talked about. And I, I think I even did this on my mission, you know what I mean? There were, there were times when I'd say, well, you know, coffee has tannic acid in it. Yeah. And, it, and so you, you come up with justifications. Uh, you try to explain it to people, right? Well, yeah. Because honestly, to be fully fair, we don't fully understand why no. some of those things no. are wrong. No, and I didn't wisdom. know that. See, yeah. I fell into that trap where... Oh, we felt like when you're talking to somebody like, <laughs> it was ultra well, common. There's, there's these reasons why. And right. it's almost like we're afraid to say, God said no. Exactly, <laughs> <You know? laughs> exactly. And I had, it was interesting because I was I was doing that and we had a member with us. So I, I served my mission in Texas. Yeah. The member that we have with us happened to have been my my young men's teacher when I was 12 years old, you know, here How in Utah. That? <laughs> and he had moved to Texas. I went to, on my mission to Texas, ran into each other. It was it was awesome. That's right? great. It was awesome. Great guy. Jason, if you ever listen to this, love you, man. <laughs> but he was the one who corrected me on that because I, I, you know, he was with us on an exchange and I said, hey, you know, talking to somebody about the word of wisdom, they had brought it up. So I was like, well, it has tannic acid. It's got all this stuff in it that's bad for you. And he, and afterward, he didn't correct me on the spot, but afterward he said, you know, that's not the reason why we're commanded to not have that stuff. The reason is, is because the prophet asked us not to. Yeah. And that means the Lord asked us not to. It has nothing to do with any of that. My grandpa is 96 years old. He drank coffee his entire life. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. So going back to the point, you know, not, not to get off on too much of a tangent, but I think that we have to be really careful and we have to really be mindful going back to us being a cultural Mormon mm-hmm. or a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Do we follow the doctrine? Do we follow the doctrine or not? Is it true or is it not, right? Yeah. Because I feel like if we're truly converted, those things aren't going to be as big of a deal as they could be mm-hmm. if we're not converted, right? Yeah. I think, and you know, on a, 
a lot of good stuff there. You know, we we are we are very much like Daniel and and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, they were plucked out of Jerusalem at a young age and put directly in Babylon. And I think for us, in very many ways, that is, we are surrounded and influenced by Babylon daily. You know, and I to the point that it's almost hard to separate. And and uh, I loved that you talked about you know going back to the foundations of things because you know we we watch TV, we listen to music. Some of those false doctrines creep in there if we're not careful. Even when we are careful, because it's so insidious and everywhere now. And so it's so easy to listen and get our eye up about something. But I, I, I'm, it's funny, I have the same reaction where I'm like, if I have a difficult time, difficult time with something, I go back and I think, okay, is the Book of Mormon true? I know that. That's something I have 100% confirmation on. Well, then that, that confirms me that Joseph Smith was a prophet, that the priesthood authority has been passed down to the current prophet, and these men have been called of God. But what I loved uh, specifically so you talk about how the most important word is the word that we're getting for the prophet now. And this actually ties into, so I was looking through last general conference, just looking for something that I felt inspired, you know, to share something that I thought would be important. And I came across Gary Stevenson's talk and he was, he gave the talk talking about the foundations of the temple. And he, he makes reference to Brigham Young, you know, when they first get to the Salt Lake Valley and marking out the temple position, right? And he says, this is where we're going to build the temple of our God, and it's going to endure to the millennium, through the millennium. And, you know, they they went through all the many processes they did to build the foundation as good as they could. They built it up. They buried it because they were worried about people coming in, and they found out there was a whole lot of problems with it. Crack. They fixed those Stones problems. Crack. Exactly. Yeah. But they used the very best technologies they did at the time. And throughout the years... The prophets have been very meticulous to make sure that temple is updated consistently with the newest technologies, even to the most recent one that Gary Stevenson's talking about, where they're putting like they're putting some earthquake uh, technology to help secure the future of this temple moving forward. Now, I think there is I love metaphors, I love parables. There is a wonderful metaphor there for us. You know, if we're the temples, God wants us to endure to the millennium, and there are. There are earthquakes that we are dealing with right now. There are bigger earthquakes on the horizon. And yes, we've had wonderful earthquake technology instilled in us, you know, from times growing up. But the most important technology is what's happening right now. And you want to relate that. So the most important word of God that we can receive is probably going to come from the prophet right now. Because that's going to be the most up-to-date, the most applicable to us. And the, the the earthquakes and the and the trials we're going to re- be receiving in the next couple of years. That is a solid metaphor, man. That's a good metaphor. I really like that because it reminds me of you know going back to the time of Christ, right? Mm-hmm. When Christ was born, when he he you know served his mission and his ministry for us and stuff, going through the atonement. It makes me think about. Why didn't the Jews recognize the Messiah, their Messiah, right? Their prophesied Messiah. These weren't casual people, right? Mm -hmm. These guys were, you know, Sadducees and Pharisees and stuff. They knew the law. They knew it back and forth. They could probably quote the Old Testament better than anyone, Mm -hmm. right? And these guys missed the Messiah. They missed him coming. Why did they miss him coming? Beyond the mark. <laughs> Beyond the mark. And Selfishness. Who, who were they looking to? They were looking to their, their own selves. Moses. Really. They oh, were yeah. looking to Moses. Yeah, they were looking back at Moses. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah they, that's they, a great point. That's why when you were bringing that up, yeah. like, it just it clicked, right? It yeah. was clicking because I was, I was actually looking over that last night. So it's, it's a fantastic point. Yeah. Because they were looking back. They were going back into the law, into the prophets. And I'm, I, I think there's even, my mind's drawn a blank here, but I think there's even a scripture where Christ says, hey, you know, if you guys were to live back then, you would have been the ones throwing the stones at the prophets, <laughs> yeah. right? But because they're dead and they're gone, you know, that they're being raised up and you guys are, you know, oh, these, these prophets were so holy and let's look at what they said and stuff. Yeah. But when the Messiah came, 
they didn't recognize him because they weren't looking to to their current temple. Yeah. They weren't, you know, keeping uh, doing good upkeep on their temple. Yeah. So they weren't they weren't ready for him yeah. when he came. They were rejecting their their foundation changes. They re- yeah, and and having the Messiah come was the entire foundation of their whole entire life and religion. Yeah. And they didn't recognize him when he came. Probably, I mean, for eternity. For eternity. <laughs> you know, yeah. like... Yeah. yeah. And it, it, it was really interesting because when I was looking at that, I was looking at the Nephites. And I'm, I'm not dogging on the Jews in Jerusalem, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. But, I, but in, in comparing those two peoples, the Nephites and the Jews in Jerusalem, right? Nephites over here in America, Jews over in Jerusalem. You look at the people, and there was definitely... I'm not saying the Nephites were perfect, because they always had problems. <laughs> yeah. They always yeah. had severe problems. Yeah. But the people that were a part of the church understood that the Mosaic Law was there to get them to the Messiah. Yeah. It was there to serve a purpose. And that they was, were really blessed with that from the beginning. They were, they they? were blessed with yeah. that knowledge. And as a result, when their Messiah came, they received him. Yeah. You know, and they there's no way they would have crucified him. Yeah. <laughs> right. Granted, they, they did have quite a bit of a cleansing beforehand. They did have a cleansing. <laughs> that helped, I think that helped a lot. That's, that's true. <laughs> I think that that's like we talked last time, that might be a little bit of a, a hint of things to come. Yeah, uh, that is a fair point for <laughs> sure. <laughs> but you're right. They they because they kept up to date with their current prophet, when when Jacob, Nephi, Alma, when they were all preaching about the Christ who was gonna come. You know, they were having, they were waiting for this to happen. You know, they, because they listened to them, they were in a better place spiritually so that when Christ did come, they were ready for it. They had, they had been doing the updates to their temple along the way so that when the earthquakes came, literal in some yeah. cases for them, yeah. they were prepared. When the darkness comes and they hear the voice, right? That's basically gives them a sermon why they can't see or do anything. Right. They go to the temple and they start discussing it. They, they're they're having a spiritual conversation on what it is that we're hearing and and these are the signs you know that Samuel you know the prophet just recently was talking about you know they were listening to those and who was who was a Lamanite yes who would not have been their prophet right they yeah. had their the Nephites had their own prophet they had Nephi yeah but Samuel came and delivered the message to them as well I thought that was interesting yeah you know because how many times do we as a people might think hey he's delivering a message oh man somebody often you know, Russia must be having a problem with this or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm using that as an example. But. And no, and, and to bring that to general conference, I think sometimes we can look we can look at the Quorum of the Twelve and the First Presidency and be like, okay, those were the good foundational talks. And then we get Joe Schmo and, and the Young Men's Presidency to talk, right? <laughs> yeah. And maybe we give it less weight. You know, maybe we, you know, some of those Nephites are like, well, he's a Lamanite. What yeah, does he I, have? He's like he needs say. to go talk to his own people. Exactly. You know? He needs to repent. You know, he <laughs> yeah, needs exactly. to come back. You know, we're we're the holy people. You know, and I wonder if if we listen to all of General Conference because, you know, it. I remember going back to Gary E. Stevenson. I remember when before he was an apostle, and certain talks, man, they hit me right to the center. Uh, they, I still remember them. <laughs> you know, I could I could recite a good portion of them to you. But it's because I was I was willing and able to listen to everybody that God had called to speak to us during that time, not just those that I expected to hear. It was also those that the Lord had been preparing, probably for months, to give a message at General Conference of something that they've been, you know, in some cases maybe their entire lives have been building up to giving some sort of message about, so that they have valid information to give from their experiences there in general conference for us to listen and make changes in our own life. Oh, absolutely. And it's interesting you bring that up because I think I, well, I don't think I know, I've definitely been guilty of that, right? Whenever the prophet comes in to address you anyone, there is a silence and <laughs> yeah. there is a a call to attention, right? Which is, I think that's, that's fair. Yeah, <laughs> and, and justifiably so. Yeah. But just like you're saying, you know, I think we should be given that same attention to anybody who's talking at general conference Mm -hmm. because if the lord is truly in charge then he has called those people and he's asking them to give up to just like you're saying to get up and to give their experience and to by the spirit deliver us a message that is from christ right Mm -hmm. 
and that's it changed the way that I that I view general conference because there was a lot of times like especially if like uh, let's say the young women's general presidency gets up to give a message I had a hard time connecting it's, with that it's a little harder because I'm know? not a young woman you know <laughs> yeah. what I mean but but that was very unfair you know what I mean for me yeah. to do and when I started to kind of grow up a little bit you know to to mature spiritually and stuff yeah. I looked at those at those talks and I started to apply them and found that there was just as much there. You know, there was just as much of a spiritual feast to be had there as there was anywhere else. I'm, I'm glad you said that because my favorite session, bar none, has always been the priesthood session. Right. Uh, there's something about it that just seems very pointed, very direct, and very. Oh, it just, it, it always, it, it sinks right into my heart, everything. And it, honestly, if I'm being fair, it's probably because I can actually focus because the kids are at home, right? <laughs> <laughs> Having young children listen to conference, I get it. Everybody, you're in that boat, you do what you can. Oh, man. But uh, It is tough when yes. you have kids. <laughs> Very tough. But I remember, what, so when they decided that they were going to flip it, right, so that they had, you know, the women conference or, and the priesthood conference, you know, once every year. Uh, you know, I was a little sad. Yeah. I was losing, you know, a little bit of tradition. And but I said, okay, I can either be a baby about this, you know, or I can actually try to learn something from it. So when, you know, when my wife would go with with her, with I think my mom went with them, but they all got together. You know, they like I did. I get together with my dad for priesthood session. I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm going to turn this on. I'm going to listen to it. And I'll tell you what. I, I probably got some of the best gems out of conference from listening to what he's telling the women than I probably got throughout the entire conference. And it, I mean, it's really interesting to hear him talk about, you know, what, what he expects of the men, of, of the women he's talking to. These are the, you know, these are the things that uh, these men should be doing for you. And that, man, man, am I falling short. And it really, it was probably the most poignant, most directed, most cutting words I received weren't even directed at me. You know, he was talking to the women of the church, and I got something from it because I was open to it. Well, not only did you get something from it, you had a gut check from it. Yes. Well, just like yeah. we were talking about, you know. And see, I can I can trace my, my train of thought back to when to when that switch was, was flipped for me. And I was listening to, it was, it was a number of years ago, but I was listening to a general conference before they had color, you know, <laughs> yeah. it was black and white. I wish I could remember what year it was, but they had a priest get up, right? Really? Uh, a 16, 17 year old priest get up for general conference. Similar to what happened last conference. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But he, he got up and I'd never seen that before. Right. Yeah. It had always been people with clout. It, you know what I, I, know, I mean? Yeah. It was dudes who had some serious, you know, chops to be able to get up there. And he got up there. And I was really impressed because, number one, if he was nervous, he didn't show it. Mm -hmm. he, he, he did great. He did fantastic. But, but everything that he got up there and said was pointed to, to young men around his age and stuff. And it was, it was powerful. It was really powerful. And uh, I think the prophet got up you know, sometime after him and, and commended him for it and stuff. And I was really impressed. But if I'm being completely honest, when he first got up, I was like, oh, what is this? <laughs> Gonna tell. I you know what I mean. The, the very truth of it, right? Exactly. Like, okay, I guess we'll, we'll endure this. I was almost minutes. ready to skip the talk. You know what yeah. I mean? But I'm glad that I listened because that changed my mind. And I was like, okay, everybody has. He gave a powerful talk. Mm -hmm. I'll have to see if I can find it and put it in the in the uh, description. But that was when I I changed my mind. I was like, okay, everybody who is up here definitely has the spirit and definitely has a message to give to somebody mm -hmm. or to a group of people, right? Yeah. And yeah, I agree with that. That's and I love you know, I I don't know about you, you know, growing up, I loved that there was this switch that happened to me when I was growing up. You know, it used to be like, okay, it was general conference time, which meant I didn't have to get dressed. I'm gonna, you know, grab a piece of paper. Mom says as long as I'm with your ear range you know, I, I'd never listened to Saturday. That was Saturday. <laughs> that was that was time sa off. Saturday you know? was holy day for us. <laughs> exactly. Else. It was time to get some video. Games, That's right. <laughs> right. Before, because I knew next Sunday, you know, the, yep. the, tomorrow I was you know, going to be able to do anything, <laughs> you know. And so, you know, I'd be drawing or whatever, listening. But at a certain point, uh, there was a change, right? And it probably somewhat 
coincided with my mission, but I found so much desire. I like I get giddy now when it comes time for general conference. And I think part of it <clears throat> is that you know, we're we're more than just physical beings, right? We are we we have a spirit. And our spirit, you know, is made up of, of energy and, and that energy and that spirit is fed by the truth, by what what we hear at General Conference. And I think when it comes time, and I know General Conference is coming, I get excited for my spirit to be fed, even if it's going to be fed some, you know, some hardtack, you know, <laughs> <laughs> some stuff I'm going to have to work a little hard to, to uh, chew on, on. And I, yep. put it in some water yep. first, let it soak. But I, I think, and that kind of led me to realize that I think probably, I think the most powerful thing, or I should say one of the most powerful things on this earth is truth. And I think that's because the majority, and, and you guys stick around long enough, I'm sure I'll say this multiple times because it's an epiphany I've had, but I think human beings in general, we're good, decent human beings. And when we get truth, we will act on it. We will, we will make a decision. We will do something usually good <laughs> with that information. And I think that's why Satan works so hard to, to hide the truth and why it's so difficult to find, you know, especially in the world of politics, <laughs> you know, yeah, it is absolutely. to find out what the truth really is. And the Gadiant and robbers, the deep state, whatever you want to call it, they were working tremendously to obscure it, to mingle it with falsehoods. Uh, but when we go to general conference, man, we get direct truth. And I think that's part of the reason why it's so powerful. And if we're there and we're listening, our spirits, our bodies will respond to that. And we'll be able to to make changes on the on the firm foundation of knowing that what we're being given is pure, unadulterated truth. It granted still through imperfect mouthpieces. So there's still weaknesses that get carried through, but man, it's some of the most direct stuff you can get right now. In the Absolutely. World. And it's interesting you say that too, because I was having the thought yesterday, having a, a very similar, you know, string of thoughts where we can take ourselves out of Babylon for for that weekend, right? And we can hear that pure, unadulterated truth given to us. And it is a spiritual feast. And I think a lot of times we don't realize how hungry our spirits are yeah. until we we start to, to feast and we start to get that that spiritual nourishment. But it reminded me of when we can take time out of our busy lives and get to the temple. For me, it's the same feeling I get. When I'm watching General Conference, it's the same feeling I have when I'm serving in the temple. Or it's the, the same feeling I have when I'm listening to somebody at sacrament meeting give a especially, you know, pointed talk to me, you know, where it's, it's just speaking to me. It's the same exact feeling for me. And I think that goes to show that, you know, Satan is very tricky. Mm -hmm. And see, we can recognize that when we start to get that spiritual nourishment. But what we don't recognize is when we're not getting that spiritual nourishment. We start to kind of starve ourselves spiritually for a little bit, and we don't recognize it. We don't pick up on it because it's very sly. Yeah. And in some cases, that is happening, and then general conference will, will come, and it's a big wake-up call to you. You're like, okay, I've been sucking it up. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, I, I, I've been... I don't want to say led astray or anything, but you've, but, you've uh, the flash and cord. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Just as, you know, God works precept by precept. You know, Satan does the same thing. We just call it different. It's mm -hmm. the flax and cord. It's right. It's the slow downhill slope. It's line upon line. Yeah. In the opposite. In the opposite direction. In the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that and I don't know why I, I, I never put that together, but I was like, that is the same feeling when I'm in the temple serving. That's the same feeling I'm getting. When I'm hearing the prophet or anyone at General Conference talk, mm -hmm. it's the same exact spirit, same exact feeling, and I just—I I don't know—that that was a, that was an epiphany for me yesterday. It shouldn't right. have been, <laughs> but yeah. it was. You know, the same exact feeling. Yeah, you know, uh, it's you keep saying that, right? It's interesting that you say that. I probably <laughs> should say it's probably divine purpose. I know, right? That you yeah. said that. Yeah. Uh, it actually probably really makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it's probably, probably you know, being directed a little bit. Exactly, there. exactly. But uh, uh, so I serve as a facilitator in a twelve-step program, and uh, I think probably one of the, the 
the most important things I've realized about sobriety when it comes to addiction is that your sobriety really is only as good as your last spiritual experience. And I think we can take that a, a step farther for us that you know our our spiritual well being probably is only as good as our last spiritual experience we had. And if and if you're if you're like me and sometimes you, you hear something like that and go, okay, when was the last time? <laughs> you know? And and it really comes down to doing those basic foundational things like reading the scriptures, praying, but General Conference, for me, has always been one of those great temple opportunities to get another spiritual experience, to, to get another wake-up call, to get another, uh, another spiritual you know, arrow you know, in my quiver so that I can keep moving forward. I, I agree with that 100%. It, it's, it, we can't rely you know, on last conference you know, for the next two years. We need something every six months. We need, that, we need to have that slow progression one step at a time. And I think... I think largely that's because, uh, for the most part, we're not going to be like Emily Younger where we get dramatic angel-shaking moments where we make these huge changes in our lives. That can still happen, and I think we could probably all look back and find some tentpole, you know, some, some paradigm-shifting moments in our lives. Yeah. But I really think, for the most part, Heavenly Father works better when we are making slow, incremental changes. Uh, and that's why, for me, when I come into General Conference, uh, my, cause there's, al there's always a wealth, honestly, we, the, the, you know, your cup runneth over that is fulfilled in conference. Every time Absolutely. you try to follow everything you're given, you might feel a little overwhelmed. There's, Drink, there's drinking a out of a fire that. hose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I love that. Drinking out of fire hose. That's hundred percent sure. And, uh, so for me, I've decided that at the very least I can try to find something, one thing that I hear that often it's said multiple times. That I can work on for the next six months, and that's going to be my that's going to be my little you know line upon line for this next six months. At the very least, if that's all I'm doing, then I I feel like I'm at least getting something from general conference. Well, and two, I think that you know you you've mentioned being able to have arrows in your quiver and stuff like that, and I think it goes the opposite way as well because there is always Satan is always lying in wait, right? And I, I don't know if you remember that old uh, seminary video of the Roman soldiers, mm -hmm. and they had their armor on, and they were out looking for yeah. the enemy. Spiritual armor. Yeah. Okay, I remember I love that. that. That one I love. It, it, it's a poignant lesson. It's very visual. Too. Yeah, it's very visual because yeah. one of those soldiers, he, he uh, you know, they get to the river's edge and stuff like that, and he keeps his armor on. Everybody else is like, man, I'm yep. tired of wearing Load this off. armor. Yeah, yep. let's take this armor off. <laughs> this breastplate of truth. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> let's go ahead and lay the sword of you know, truth and righteousness yeah, right. down. So yeah. And uh, but, but it was a very good object lesson in that, you know, I think that when we do the things we're supposed to do, right, we've made covenants with the Lord at baptism. We've made all sorts of covenants as we as we go along in our life. And as we strive to live the gospel, there is a literal, actual, protective barrier that's placed over us. Yeah, I believe that. I totally believe that. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed it big time in my life, right? When I put forth the effort, and when I am making sure that I am striving to have those spiritual experiences, just like you were talking about, Right. If we're having those spiritual experiences on a semi-regular basis, because we can and we're supposed to, right? Mm -hmm. I remember on my mission, we were told, um, I can't remember if it was Elder Rasband. He wasn't a, a member of the Twelve back then, but he came to our mission and told us, you guys are just as able to have a sacred grove experience as anybody else. Mm -hmm. you know, And that was a big wake-up call uh, to us missionaries, but if we strive for those experiences, there is an actual protective field of some kind placed on us, mm -hmm. and those darts of the adversary are blocked and rebuked, right? Mm -hmm. And that, when I figured that out, it, it gave me a lot more motivation to study the scriptures daily, you know what I mean? Because for a long time I struggled with that. After my mission, you know, when you get off your mission, you're like, I'm going to study every day. I'm still <laughs> yeah. going gonna to get up early and read you're an like, hour, oh, you wow. know. More than an hour for yeah. study. What will I do with all that time? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I'll tell you what you do with all that time. You'll forget about it. Exactly. And then. exactly. You, you, get, you, get you will lazy. become slothful. <laughs> I'm, I'm speaking from personal experience. Here. Yep. No, that's <laughs> me too. 
And I think that, you know, as as life gets busier, as you get a family, as time becomes an extremely precious commodity, right? For you guys listening, we get up at 5.30 to record this so it doesn't take away from family time. Yep. So something always has to give, yep. right? And and so as time gets more of becomes more of a precious commodity, I think that's just human nature is to start, you start to compartmentalize everything and you say, okay, yeah, I'll read my scriptures, but maybe I'll just do half hour. And then pretty soon it's 20 minutes. And then pretty soon it's like, maybe whenever I go to the bathroom, I'll read the scriptures. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? yeah. But something that I have applied, and here's my main point with this, something that I have applied in my life, I read a scripture in Alma. I can't remember the exact chapter, but it was, I think it was around 34 through 36, something like that. And Alma says in there, lie your head down to the Lord, right? He's, he's, he's just delivered the, you know, the huge chapter on faith and stuff like that. But he gives the advice to lie your head down to the Lord. So I said, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to care so much about the quantity of scripture study that I get, but I'm going to take that and I'm going to, before I go to sleep, I'm going to say my, my prayers, get in my bed, and I'm going to read my scriptures, and that will be the last thing I do before I go to bed, no matter what. Huh. I don't look at any you know, YouTube videos or anything like that. That yeah. is the last thing I do before I go to bed. And sometimes it's only 10 verses. Yeah. You know? But just doing that, I noticed that protection increased tenfold. It was amazing. It was a huge, a huge uh, testimony builder for me. Because I took something that a prophet said, I applied it. And it worked. Go figure. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was incredible. I just, you know, it, it just worked. I had, I, I have noticed a huge protective barrier over me and my family as well. And it, it, it's, it was a huge testimony builder. Yeah. And I like what you say because another thing that's been really hitting me recently is the whole idea of opportunity costs. And for anyone who doesn't know what that is, it, it basically means that we have we are beings of finite time we we are not god you know he can do whatever he wants with time and i think that's very much on purpose yeah. i think a big part of this earthly test is the fact that we are we are constrained by time and and as we get close to the last days there is so much to draw upon our time and i've realized recently Lots that of distractions yeah and, you know, and Elder Oaks gave a talk a long time ago about good, better, and best. Those of you who've heard that, you know what I'm talking about. But there, there's the best things to choose from in our lives. And I've realized at this point in my life, I have, I have multiple bests that are competing for my time. Yeah. And even then, I have to figure out how I'm going to divide it up. Everything we do comes at the cost of doing something else. And that's the whole idea behind opportunity costs. And so... We have to decide, are we willing to sacrifice maybe something that we would even deem as best for something that is the better best? <laughs> you know, we were, we were, we were sifting, you know, shift, uh, splitting hairs, you know, at this point, because we have a, just so much to choose from and what we can do. And I think it can be a little difficult. You know, do you choose from, you know, refining that, that school project or reading your scriptures? You know, do you choose from, uh, you know, making sure you get that, that work project done, uh, you know, perfectly? Or do you spend some time playing with your kids? We are, we are at a, a difficult time right now. And, and if anything, I feel like when I come out of a conference, I feel like I get a much clearer picture of what's really important. You know, we, we have talked about how we're, we're living in Babylon and those ideas creep in, right? And we kind of lose... Uh, touch with some of the most important stuff that we have and and to go along with this i was listening to the unashamed podcast which uh the, that's the death dynasty guys their father phil robertson and, and two of his sons they talk i mean they, they kind of had the same thing we've had where they felt like the, the need to put out into the you know the cosmic sphere of, of microphone verse uh, uh what they're feeling and what they're thinking but they had a group of people on talking about the education of children and they they said something like they reinforced to me that you know as a parent your number one priority is teaching your children how to follow god like that is number one absolutely i think we get so concerned about 
teaching them, you know, the ABCs and the one, two, threes. He's like, that's important, but that is secondary. Our most important job is to teach them to follow Christ. And man, that, that hit me at the center. And I felt the shift. I felt that, okay, you know what? Certain things that I'm so worried about probably aren't as important as I'm making sure that I'm reading the scriptures with them, that I'm, I'm studying Kung to follow me with them, that, that I take time to have spiritual discussions with them when they're ready and able to do it. You know, instead of worrying so much about, okay, did the chores get done? Did your homework get done? How many times do I'm like, you know, have you, have you talked with God today? Yeah. You know? And it's interesting that you, that you bring that up too, because as you're saying that I'm getting, I'm, I'm just, I'm getting images in my mind of a giant bear trap. Mm-hmm. There's always a giant bear trap waiting to get us or our kids. It's always there. And if we're not doing those things, if we're not doing the things, you know, the, the primary answers, reading your scriptures, uh, saying your prayers, family home evening, if we're not doing those things, eventually your vision starts to, it's like you get horse blinders on and your vision starts to slowly decrease and you can't see the bear trap. Yeah. And eventually you step on the bear trap or your kid steps on the bear trap, you mm-hmm. know? And that's, it's a very sobering thought because if you don't take the time, if we don't take the time to teach our kids, somebody will, Satan will take yeah. the time. Uh, and, and the government and, and the government and the deep state, they Absolutely. are very much, they are very much concerned in educating your yeah. child. If you're not, they are, more, they than are willing, more than willing to, yeah. More than willing to put in the time and effort to get them taught. Yeah. They right? recognize the value of it. It's Absolutely. And, you know, it, it, it reminds me of Adam and Eve's kids, right? They were sitting there. They, they actually were doing everything right, I, I assume, anyway. Yeah. You know, I, we don't have a lot of scripture on the subject. I but, like to think so. But, yeah, you would think, you know, Adam and Eve would be pretty solid with their, with their family home evening and their scriptures and stuff like that. But, you know, Satan was just chomping at the bit, even to the point where he appears as an angel of light and deceives his kids, and he tells them, hey, don't listen to your parents. Yeah. You know, there is that ever present danger. Just just there it's a bear trap there waiting to get us or our kids. And I think as we get older, that bear trap is more geared towards our kids, right? Mm-hmm. There's bait put on it that's just for our kids. And it will snap and it will get our kids if we don't put in the time. Yeah, man, that there's a cautionary tale for you. And general conference, you know. There are times when I don't feel like watching. You, know? <laughs> I've been there. you know what I mean? Yep. There's times when you've had a rough week, when you've, you know, you've worked a ton of hours and stuff, and you just want to relax, yeah. right? But again, if we're not on our guard, that bear trap is just waiting. Yeah. Yeah, I think probably, as we're getting close to the end, but probably one of my favorite things about General Conference is, you know, in your life, you can't always be 100% sure where God would want you to be at any given moment. Right. Part of, I think that's actually part of the test <clears throat> is to figure out what God wants you to be doing at any given moment. But I love when conference comes around because I, I can feel you know, 90, let's say 99% confident. I know where the Lord would have me at that point, what I'm supposed to be doing. And when I'm sitting down listening to conference, very rarely have I felt the need, okay, I need to be doing something else right now, you know. I feel the Lord's approval, you know, and, and oh man, it's such, it's such a powerful and beautiful experience to have, to know that you're doing what Heavenly Father wants you to do and have that confidence and that faith in it. Oh, it's, it's such a relieving effect in this day and age where I'm constantly wondering if the things I'm doing, I should be doing. And, and going back to the kids, I can't think of anything better. Like my, I, I think back to my mom, who's probably going to listen to this because she's my mom. She loves me. <laughs> you know, got to support, man. Support, <laughs> know, the support. family. <laughs> but she was always on the couch watching conference earnestly, you know, no matter what we were doing. And I think, and if I remember right, I imagine she probably encouraged us softly, why don't you come and listen, you know, maybe put down the pencil, you know. I think there was a lot of, and, and the visual uh, sermon that I got from that, was worth immense amount to my life and my spiritual nature Yeah. to the point that I started to want to emulate that. And so if we want to help our kids to recognize, hey, general conference is of worth. There is truth there. There's going to be stuff that you're going to get that will direct our kids for good long after they've left our sphere of influence. If they see us on, you know, on the couch listening to the prophet, they are 10 times more likely to do the same thing. 
Absolutely, and that's something my, my parents did very well. Was when, when it was general conference, there was never even talk about going camping or no. doing picnic, <laughs> anything else. It was general conference, and that you know same exact influence in my life. I I saw that example, and 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 as a result, I have to do that as a parent, right? And I'm not saying I'm fantastic or perfect with that or anything like yeah. that, but. When it's general conference, you know, me and my wife both agreed that, hey, conference is going to be on, and it's going to be on on multiple devices. You mm-hmm. know, the kids will be able to hear it, even if, you know, we don't make them sit through all of it because they're little. Right. Right now. They, they can only take so much. <laughs> yeah, the, the ADD is there's, strong, you know. Yeah, there's attention loss. That exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, you, you know, we, we make them sit through one session. That, that's our rule. And as they get older, we, we increase upon that, right? It's the yeah, line yeah. upon line thing. Yeah. But it, they're at least able to hear it in the background. And they know, either consciously or, or subconsciously, that mom and dad are listening and they're watching and they're taking notes, hopefully. Yeah. When they're not breaking up fights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've noticed my notes, you know, when I was younger. Exactly. Man, I had, you know, paragraphs under each person. I had their you name. You had your own scriptures. <laughs> now, I'm lucky. Sometimes I have whole sessions with nothing written underneath exactly. it. Exactly. And I've, I just told myself that that's okay. You know, mm-hmm. uh, part of being uh, a parent of younger children is is the struggle. Yeah. But, the, you know, it, this goes back to something you said earlier, but I love that the Lord accepts our meager uh, profferings of sacrifice, whatever they Our widow's might. Yeah. Exactly. And he he turns it into gold. He sanctifies it. He recognizes when we use our agency to do something good that he's asked us to do, he will make it work ten times stronger than it should have been able to. He he takes that dross we put on the altar and he turns it into grace. He turns it with the power of the atonement through his son. Uh, he makes it of infinite worth to us. So wherever we are, if we make an effort this coming you know, this coming weekend, your conference, I guarantee the Lord will return it back to you in, in multiplicitive dividends. Absolutely. Absolutely. He is, he said it multiple times throughout the scriptures, and I'm pretty sure that this phrase exists in just about every standard work that we have, right, in all the scriptures. And his, the phrase is, my hand or my arm is stretched out still. That appears over multiple uh, scriptures, I, like I think it's in the Old Testament, the New Testament, you know, the Book of Mormon. But that that phrase always stood out to me because he's saying, "Hey, I don't care what you've done." You know what I mean? Not that he doesn't care, but none of us are are beyond the help of the Savior, right? His arm is stretched out still, no matter what. And you can't ever really. I just had this thought as you were saying that you can't compare yourself to the brethren you can't compare yourself to mm-hmm. anybody to your bishop you got to compare yourself to yourself yeah. are you better than you were yesterday you know are you are you watching two sessions of general conference instead of one yeah <laughs> I mean, if that's where you're at man <laughs> yeah. i'll cheer you on <laughs> absolutely if you're trying just like you're saying if you're trying if you're giving your your meager offering on the altar the lord will take that and he will accept it just as much as he will the prophet's offering yeah. you know which is a lot more than us, <laughs> right? Definitely feels that way. Yes, <laughs> it's hard to compete. <laughs> so don't. <laughs> here, I'm gonna I'm gonna give my closing my yeah. closing statement here with this. Go for it. Okay. And this is in. Uh, this is I think this is President Kimball saying this. Almost to a man, the twelve come from humble beginnings, as it as it was when he was there. The living twelve are welded together in the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When the call came, each has put down their nets, so to speak, and followed the Lord. President Kimball is remembered for his statement, My life is like my shoes, to be worn out in service. That applies to all members of the twelve. We also wear ourselves out in the service of the Lord, and we do so willingly. I will take counsel from anybody like that yeah. and especially from from the lord's 12 the the foundation right that he set forth when he was personally ministering in, on in his earth life i will i will i will take counsel and 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 revelation and 
anything that those guys have to say seriously and with with you know honor yeah. and integrity and everything else because I definitely can't say of myself that I'm wearing myself out in the service of God right yeah. and these guys are in their 90s <laughs> in yes. many cases yeah. right and they're dancing circles around around us mid 30s guys right yeah. they are the mouthpieces of God they have been instructed spiritually they've been given revelation to give specifically for us. The Lord could bypass them completely, but that's not how he does things, right? You mentioned that scripture at the beginning. Surely the, lo the Lord God doeth nothing, but that he doeth through his servants, the prophets, yeah. right? He's always going. He has a pattern. He's honoring that pattern today. If we know anything about Spencer Kimball, uh, he wore out those shoes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you know, he, yeah, that's a good analogy for him. And I, it's funny, I, I have a quote as well. I wasn't sure I was going to use it, but this is from that talk I referenced earlier, but yeah, I think it goes along. It says, and this will be my closing. You know, yeah. What are the foundational elements of my spiritual and emotional character that will allow me and my family to remain steadfast and immovable, even to withstand the earth shaking and tumultuous seismic events that will surely take place in our lives? And he was, you know, using that in reference to the temple and, and what we do. And, and I would say for me, probably some of the best stuff I can do to, to think about what, what are my foundations. And it's, it's listening to my, to the prophet, to the man that I sustain as the Lord's mouthpiece here on the earth. Absolutely. I will give a good hearty amen to that as well. And, and, amen, uh, sir. Amen, sir. <laughs> and to all of you listening, uh, walk as children of the light. That's right. Walk as children of the light. Name Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <laughs>